On the morning of November 17, 2013, Matt Wells would witness one of the most frightening things anyone can ever see, a powerful tornado tearing up his hometown of Washington, Illinois. If we look a little bit closer, we can see millions of pieces of debris orbiting around the tornado. Thankfully, Matt was able to escape from the path of the tornado, but that was not the case for everyone in town. Holy shit. This is the full story of the Washington tornado. Six months earlier, in May of 2013, two of the most infamous tornadoes would touch down in the Oklahoma City area, the Moore EF-5 and the 2.6 mile wide El Reno Beast. While both of these tornadoes were extremely unique, they did both occur in May, by far the most active month for severe weather in the United States. And as the year drew on, summer came and went, leading to fall, a season that's not typically associated with tornadoes, especially in the Midwest. However, in mid-November, the forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center were monitoring a very powerful jet streak overlapping an area with extremely warm and moist air in Illinois and Indiana. Despite it being mid-November, all the ingredients for a severe weather setup were taking shape, and as a result, the Storm Prediction Center would issue a rare high risk for a 30% chance of tornadoes centered on Illinois and Indiana. And on the morning of Sunday, November 17th, while most were going about their day, whether it was at church or shopping at a mall, storms would initiate across central Illinois the high risk was underway. Meteorologists monitoring the situation would take note of a dominant supercell near the city of Peoria, Illinois, and would issue the very first tornado warning of the day. And at 10.52 in the morning, a tornado would touch down right on the Illinois River. The tornado would continue northeast at 52 miles an hour, initially traveling over open fields. However, it was rapidly closing in on the town of Pekin, Illinois. Pekin, if you are in the path of this cell, now is the time to take shelter, get to your basement, get to the centermost portion of your home, and take cover. I am hearing things right now, Chuck. Yes. I think we, um, we may need to take shelter right yes. now ourselves. We do. We need to go off here. Yeah. We will be back when we can. Right. The tornado would once again cross the Illinois River and was about to bear down on the town of Pekin, Illinois. The moment the tornado moved into town was captured on video, and while it only appeared as a dusty circulation, it would produce EF2 level damage, affecting over 179 homes, six businesses, as well as injuring 10 residents, which could have been much worse if it weren't for the tornado warning issued by the National Weather Service prior to the tornado entering town. Four and a half miles after touching down, the Pekin tornado would lift right on the doorstep of the Henderson funeral home. And while this circulation had died, the day was far from over. Like a giant monster, the storm was taking a deep breath, forming a new hook on radar. And sure enough, at 10.59, a second tornado would touch down. Immediately after forming, this tornado was already stronger than the Pekin EF-2. As the tornado moved northeast, it would come within a few hundred yards of the WEEK studio where the anchors took shelter just we a few minutes take prior. Shelter right yes. now ourselves. We do. Video taken around this time would show how the tornado was an extremely compact circulation. The tornado would then pass through the parking lot of the newly built Summit Point Church. And at 11 o'clock, the National Weather Service would broadcast an extremely ominous message. A confirmed tornado was located near East Peoria at 10.58 a.m. Washington will be affected around 11.05 a.m. The message was clear, and the people downstream should have immediately taken cover. Steve Neubauer, aware of the oncoming threat, was frantically looking for his pet cats. Tragically, he did not make it downstairs in time and would be the first victim of the tornado. Satellite imagery shows how the tornado shredded these two homes into tiny little pieces. The tornado would continue its march northeast at over 55 miles per hour. It was right around this time, Gary Dieters and his son would record the tornado from the northwest. It's up, it's up. At the beginning of Gary's video, the tornado had the same appearance as it did earlier in its life, a large funnel with the circulation underneath. You can also clearly hear the jet-like roar from the tornado, a sound that's only associated with strong tornadoes. Holy crap. 
As they continued to record, Gary would make the correct decision to take cover in a bank. And it was right around this time when they would capture one of the most pivotal moments in the entire life of the tornado. To the southeast of the tornado, a secondary vortex would merge with the main tornadic circulation. This process would rapidly intensify the tornado, making an already bad situation even worse. From this moment on, the tornado would produce an unbroken swath of high-end ia 4 level damage. Sadly, Army veteran Charles Kuntz was caught right in the crosshairs. He would initially survive, but in critical condition. Six weeks later, Charles would pass. The tornado was now entering the town of Washington, Illinois, and it was only getting stronger. Washington resident Greg Berkland would have by far the best view of the tornado as it went into town. You can see in his video all the dead leaves flying through the air, something that almost never happens in tornado videos. Because tornadoes don't typically occur at this time of year, especially in Illinois. It's also, in my opinion, one of the most incredible tornado videos. You can really see the raw power of the tornado as it moves across the horizon. And while I appreciate this video, Greg really should have taken cover. Although I'm not gonna lie, I probably would have been outside doing the same thing. tornado then crossed Washington Road and was now moving into the much more densely populated part of town. It was also around this time Chris Lancaster would begin recording the tornado from his back patio. Notice how in Chris's video, the tornado wasn't moving side to side, rather it was getting larger and larger. And while Chris was in danger, other residents were already feeling the impact of the tornado. 82 year old Rosemond Allison was taking cover as her home took a direct hit. Tragically, the injuries she would sustain would be too much. She would pass nine days later. The tornado would continue marching its way through town at an incredible pace of over 55 miles per hour, demolishing every single home in its path. And it was only getting stronger and stronger, eventually impacting Mackenzie Street, where it would fully sweep three homes off of their foundations, leaving only the hardwood floors and stairwell to the basements. Right as the tornado was doing some of its worst damage, Mark Wells would begin recording out his back door. Holy moly, all right. Holy shit. All right, I gotta go. I'm coming, honey. Mark would make the correct choice and take cover in his basement with his daughter, Josie. Despite the horrifying sounds of the tornado, Mark and his daughter would survive. However, their home was gone. The neighbors' homes to the north were even worse as they were completely swept off of their foundations. Now, going back to Chris Lancaster, who was still recording the tornado from his back patio. And as the tornado got closer and closer, the winds would get progressively stronger and stronger until it became too much and the home would catastrophically fail, sending Chris flying. Chris was just barely south of the main core of the tornado and miraculously, he would escape with only a few cuts on his face. The tornado was now leaving Washington, and it was at this moment Matt Wells began recording his encounter from the north directly in the path, but he was making the wise choice to drive west away from the tornado. Millions of pieces of debris swirled around the tornado, almost resembling confetti. However, this confetti was fragments of homes from the town of Washington. This video is, in my opinion, one of the most incredible tornado videos ever captured, and it shows just how strong the Washington tornado became. Now, compare this to what it looked like right before it hit town. The difference is ridiculous. 
as the tornado left Washington, it was doing another incredible thing that can only be seen from satellite imagery. It would leave behind cycloidal markings. These markings are caused by the subvortices within the tornado, which are areas of concentrated power that are both rotating and translating, resulting in this distinctive pattern in the ground, what I consider to be a tornado's fingerprint. After over 12 miles, the tornado was still going strong. Meanwhile, back in town, the people of Washington emerged from the debris. I got her. I got her. Grab her. Got her. Okay. Let me go. Let me go. Due to favorable atmospheric conditions, the tornado persisted well past the town of Washington and was now closing in on the town of Roanoke, Illinois. The tornado would pass only a few hundred yards from the Parsons Manufacturing Plant the same facility that took a direct hit from a violent F4 tornado back in 2004. The tornado continued northeast at over 50 miles per hour, mostly over open fields. However, it was now setting its sights on another town, Minoke, Illinois, where Carla Konsecki was recording the tornado as she was driving south on Interstate 39. Little did she know, she was directly in the path of the violent tornado. Carlo would barely escape the tornado's wrath as the core of the tornado passed only a few hundred yards to the north. At this point, the tornado had been on the ground for over 35 miles, but it was still going strong. After barely missing the town of Minoke, Illinois, almost killing Carla Konsecki, it would nearly hit Dana, Illinois, continue northeast, and at 1147, the tornado would lift near the town of Long Point, Illinois. The Washington tornado had left a path of destruction of over 45 miles, destroying over 1,000 homes, which equated to about $950 million in damage, putting it in the top 10 costliest tornadoes at the time. And even though the Washington tornado had lifted, the supercell was still going strong and would put down two other EF2 tornadoes. I also want to mention the deadly tornado that happened down south in New Menden, Illinois, killing three, and an EF3 tornado that would affect Brookport, Kentucky, killing another three people. In total, over 77 tornadoes would touch down on November 17th, 2013, a time of year that really shouldn't see any tornadoes. But that's not the end of the story. How were the people of Washington going to recover from a tornado that destroyed over 1,000 homes in town? Almost immediately, the locals would get to work cleaning up the debris, donating supplies, and housing the unfortunate ones who now no longer had a home. And while the people were putting their blood, sweat, and tears into fixing their hometown, the mayor would ask for help from the federal government, applying for a $26 million grant from FEMA. Unfortunately, FEMA would deny the request, citing a rule the threshold required for FEMA to approve the aid is equal to $1.35 times the state population. And given that the Illinois state population at the time was around 13 million, for some reason, FEMA did not grant Washington any federal aid, which is disgusting. The Washington tornado was one of the most impactful tornadoes ever. Yet for some reason, FEMA did not consider that disaster enough that makes zero sense. And it really sets a horrible precedent and basically says any tornado that occurs in a highly populated state like Illinois is not going to get any help from the federal government. We really feel that the federal law uh, that the FEMA follows needs uh, fundamental reform and improvement. Uh, it really is uh, unfair to large states like Illinois and other large states as well uh, that uh, have big cities in them, but also many rural areas. And the formula that FEMA has followed with respect to aid to municipalities and counties just isn't fair. And while the situation surrounding the FEMA funding is extremely disheartening, I do want to talk about some of the positive takeaways. One of the most remarkable things about the Washington tornado is that it only killed three people. And while yes, three people is three too many, given the situation of a violent tornado going directly through a densely populated area, three dead is very low. So why did only three die? In my opinion, the main reason for the low death count was the remarkable job done by the meteorologists at the National Weather Service. 
While the Washington tornado was a freak tornado, the meteorologists saw it coming. They warned it and got the message out well ahead of time, informing everyone in its path to get to cover, saving countless lives. Now compare that to the Plainfield F5, another violent tornado that occurred in Illinois, but had no tornado warning. The confusion surrounding the Plainfield tornado was a huge issue and is the main reason why 20 people died because none of those 20 knew what was coming their way. Another reason for the low death count was the quality of construction in Washington. Most of the homes had basements, meaning almost everybody had a safe place to go. Now compare that to Moore, Oklahoma, where almost none of the homes have basements. And sadly, the EF5 tornado that went through Moore, Oklahoma earlier the same year would kill a far greater number at 24. In the years following, Washington would fully recover. It's now nearly impossible to see where the tornado went through town, 